insurance program is why we are relevant. Our civil rights and women's rights to change is why we are relevant. I ask for your vote for state party chair. Together, we tell the Republicans, you I was different. I never thought I was gay because I didn't know what it was. I had no role models. I had no experience around that. Their names are Rose, Anna, Darcy. I grew up in a Texas working class family. My family all came to the Houston area, to Baytown, after World War II. My dad, he was always uh, a man of few words. I wasn't close to him, but we never had any problems. My dad worked his whole life for basically a minimum wage kind of job at working in the lumberyard. He was more into cutting, fishing, and I was more of the bookworm, stay at home. He died a uh, heart attack in 1984. My brother was a meat wrapper in a grocery store. I remember going to a union meeting with my mom where they were settling a contract, and the contract was about pay raise and all the meat wrappers were getting 25 cents an hour pay raise and all the butchers were getting a dollar. I remember the union guys saying, you know, this is the best we're ever gonna get. And my mother, she brought the women to vote down the union contract to go out on strike. I asked my mom, I said, you know, why did you do that? She said, well, Glenn, only this squeaky will ever get some goods. My brother was always the one who would say, you know, you got to stand up, you got to fight back. You know, you got to speak out. If you don't do it, nobody else is going to. That was sort of the beginning of the activism. Somewhere in Des Moines or San Antonio, there's a young gay person who all of a sudden realizes that she or he is gay, knows that if the parents find out, they'll be tossed out of the house. The classmates would taunt the child, and the Anita Bryans and John Briggs are doing their bit on TV, and that child had several options. Staying in a closet, suicide, and then one day that child might open a paper and it says homosexual elected in San Francisco, and there are two new options. The option is to go to California, in San Antonio and fight. I went to college the height in Vietnam War. Immediately was involved in farm worker issues and the great boycott with Cesar Chavez, anti-war things, organized the first Earth Day. I was paying attention to gay issues. In Houston, Texas, KPFT operates at 90.1 FM. I did find the Civica Radio, alternative radio, out of Houston, they had gay programming. Along the Gulf Freeway, it's the sound of modern American music. The first political thing that I followed in gay politics was her nut selection. I remember listening on the radio when he gave this speech and said, somewhere out there, there's a young gay person that is hearing my voice for the first time and understanding they're not alone. That was very true, because I was listening to Harvey Gulf. When he said that, I was living in College Station. That was all over there. Certainly not something I was 
got to deal with. And like most positive gay men at that point in time, I had come to be accepting in myself. I was an elementary school teacher, certainly not going to be out. This, you're immediately fired and would never be hired again. My relationships were all fleeting. Let's just say less than fulfilling because there weren't any friendships. I didn't have gay friends. You were deathly scared of being found out. Most all of my interaction was for a foreigner. By the time we get to the 1980s, still teaching in Davisota, and I help a young man named Ed Paperton run for the state senate. He gets elected. I decide when I want to come to Austin. Austin, Texas, a dynamic city long known for its quality of life and scenic beauty, is today the fastest growing metropolis in the South and Southwest United States. Austin was the nirvana, both politically and I found the gay community. I found bars on 4th Street, the Waterley Counseling Center. They had a group therapy for men thinking about coming out. And so all of a sudden, I was now out to people that I became friends with. I decided to run for the legislature and ran conventional campaign, but I got 38% of the vote. And from that, got invited by Senator Oscar Malsey to work for him in the 1983 legislative session. And by that point, it was like, okay, I'm permanently now, you'll live in Austin. Wasn't until 1985 with hints of the gay, gay plague. plague. has become an epidemic unprecedented in the history of American medicine. That today from the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, topping the list of likely victims are male homosexuals who have many partners and drug users who inject themselves with needles. Medical experts say the disease kills four out of every ten people it strikes and that it threatens to explode in the nation's cities. There were some men in Austin who had AIDS. And I learned in Waterloo Counseling, we're creating an organization called the Austin AIDS Project, and they wanted volunteers. So I immediately said, I want to do this. So I went through a training, and the project was called the Buddy Program. And you were given the name of somebody who had HIV and knocked on their door, said, I'm here to be your buddy, to help you out you know, through these last days. They typically were going to die in a matter of weeks or months, but the discrimination, people got sick, they lost their job, they lost their insurance, they got kicked out of their house. No state agency, no local agencies would see them. From where I'm sitting, I'm working at the legislature and it was like, there are all these programs, they're disability. People should be able to get disability. And of course, I found out immediately that to get disability, you had to do an in-person interview, but no social security people would do an in-person interview because they thought you would get it. And so I remember taking my guy, him in a wheelchair, sitting on the curb, and I standing in the door of the social security office. We're gonna do an interview. I'm gonna stand right here in the door. You ask the question, I'll relay it out to him. He can answer it. I'll repeat it back to you. And so I did an interview standing in a doorway in November of 1985. Robert Burstein, the commissioner of health, was giving a speech. In the question and answer period, somebody asked him, what are you going to do about these gay people who are passing on AIDS? And Burstein says, we're going to have to make it a quarantinable disease. Quarantine law was anybody that had that disease could be quarantined, not he arrested, and held until they were no longer infectious. There's been some talk uh, about quarantining AIDS victims, just block them away from society. Medically, ethically, responsibility, will it work? Well, I'll start my, with you. My personal opinion is that it, it's completely impractical. First of all, AIDS is not casually contagious. No one really knows that people with AIDS are contagious. It's impractical to even consider, and it's, I mean, there's no way that anybody could monitor it or find all the people with AIDS because they're not all reported. And secondly, it's a violation of civil rights. It doesn't make any sense at all. So gay men were pretty great 
And so I'm sitting in Oscar Mossy's office as a legislative aide, representing Dallas, Texas, and they call up Senator Mossy's office and they said, can the Senator do anything to stop this? I'm thinking, what do we do? So I go to Oscar and he says, what do you think we should do? And I, I said, somebody ought to go organize the hearing. And Mozzie took a long shot of whiskey. And he said, young man, when somebody ought to do something, that somebody should go do it. That was right before Christmas, about this morning. I, to see my mom and I stop in Houston at a gay bar and I get a This Week in Texas magazine. I flip to the back of it, gay resources listed. One of them was the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. I made a cold call. I get Jeff Levy, you know, one of the most prominent gay activists in history. Jeff on the phone. I said, I gotta organize this hearing and I need an expert witness. And he said, you need to call Dr. Mathilde Krim at Sloan Kettering. You just testified before Congress. Let me give you a phone number. So he gives me a phone number. And so I go to Baytown. So I'm sitting in my mother's living room while she's cooking dinner and make a phone call to the most prominent AIDS researcher in the world. I think I'm thinking to her secretary and I tell her, hey, we have this hearing. I need an expert witness. I have no money. Is there any way Dr. Krim will come? And then the boy says, this is Dr. Krim and I'll be there. So in the next weeks, I here in Austin, I organize about 25 witnesses. The hearing comes off, Senator Mosley's worked with the governor, getting the members of the Board of Health to postpone the AIDS quarantine issue. Think about it, the public health authority in Texas in almost every county was the county sheriff. Gay men were pretty much at risk of being just rounded out and live out the rest of their life in the county jail. So people were freaked. The Board of Health wrote down the proposal with a caveat that during the next legislative session, we would work on a bill to put due process into the quarantine stage so that it wasn't as scary. The press was there. It was the first quarantine hearing anywhere in the country. Most all my witnesses were closeted gay men. Dr. Krim had already left early. And so I ended up as a legislative aide standing in front of a camera. And I go home that night, stood at my TV and flipped the channel changer. I end up on CBS. Good evening, Dan Rather reporting. And Dan Rather announces AIDS quarantine in Texas. And there's a picture of me on the national TV machine. To this day, I have no idea what I said. All I could see was big yellow letters across my chest that said Glenn Max, gay activist. And I can just tell everybody, oh, it was a misunderstanding. I'm just a legislative aide. The more I thought about it, the more I thought, can't explain this away. I'm just going to deal with it. I go to the Capitol the next day. Senator Mosley doesn't say a word about it. Life went on. I had about a half dozen Democratic state senators who were all asked me to come to work for them after I left Mosley's employment at the end of the year. And I learned in the next couple of weeks that all those jobs were gone. Everybody said, I don't have a problem with it. But I don't know how I explain to anybody having an openly gay person working on my staff. That was from the liberal Democrats. I had decided we're going to have to have a full-blown lobby effort on this quarantine bill. I called together a meeting of gay activists from across the state. Nelson Thibodeau, Bill Nelson, Terry Thibodeau from Dallas, Sue Level, Denise Parker, Austin activists, San Antonio activists. Then I said, we have to create an organization. So I... I went and filed it with the Secretary of State as a nonprofit political organization. And first order of business was to hire a lobbyist, only executive director. I'll do it. My job's coming to an end. So I went basically from closet to chief humbo of the state. The rest is sort of history. In 1990, during the Ann Richards campaign, the night before the election, I got a bunch of university Democrats, college kids helping me get ready to do phone banks and block walking the next day. And the kids started 
talking about, what are you going to do in the Richards administration? Some of them say, oh, I'm going to be on the boards of Parks and Wildlife, or I'm going to be on the UT Regents. And then one of them turned to me and said, Glenn, you actually probably will get an appointment. What are you going to be? And I said, um, I think if Ann Richards wins, she's going to appoint Linda Guerrero to her administration, and so I'm going to run for her seat. The next day, we go through election day, Richards gets elected. But the next morning, after the election, back at the headquarters, every activist, lobbyist person was showing up to kiss the ring of the future governor. And I'm there and I'm helping usher people in and out. And the first one I see is Joe Gunn, the Texas AFL-CIO labor president. And I said, hey, John, if Linda gets appointed, I think I'm going to run for her seat. He said, you'd be great. I said, terrific. But his eyes told me something different. His eyes said, he's queer. Can we support a gay person? So I turned around and there's Ollie Basteras, the president of the Texas State Teachers Association, where I'd been on the lobby board of the teachers when I was a teacher, teacher activist. And I said, Ollie, I'm gonna run for the legislature. Man, you'd be great. The same thing. The body language was, oh, crap. I did that all morning long. By the end of the day, I thought, I'm going to file just to put these people on notice to see what they'll do with somebody that's openly gay, totally qualified. They want to admit it. One of the best people that they can have for the legislature. So a couple of days later, I go in to see Ann Richards and I say, Ann, I, I think I'm going to run for Linda's seat. She looked at me. She said, oh, Glenn, no. And I was just like crushed. Here's my mentor, somebody I just adored. And she said, don't do it. And I said, why not? And she said, because you might win. She said, and then it's going to be the worst experience of your life because they're not going to let you do anything that you really care about because they're going to pigeonhole you as the gay guy. And so you're not going to be able to work on any issues other than that. So I left there and I went to lunch with Tom Doyle. He's the litigation arm of the gay community. And I tell Tom, I'm going to run. Tom then said something that was really important to me. He said, if you do it and you win, you won't make your mark in passing a gay civil rights bill. You won't make your mark passing AIDS legislation. He said, what you will do that's most important is that someday you'll be standing at the front mic and you'll be moving adoption of a bill for kids. It passes the legislature and nobody cares at all that you're a gay man. And I asked somebody, what did I do that, that you remember the most? They'll always say, you passed the children's health insurance program. Right before we passed the children's health insurance program on the house floor, I went to the mic and said, I'm gonna give a one minute personal privilege speech here. I just wanted everybody to know that this is the most important thing that I'll ever do for the gay and lesbian community when we pass this bill. And it passed, and my orientation had nothing to do with it. And I guess the most important thing of all things I've done in my career, I was at the Houston Gay Pride, and just sitting there, and all of a sudden, I look over, and there's this kid, maybe 13, 14 years old. He said, are you Glenn Maxey? And I said, yeah. And he's cool. I want to grow up and be just like you. That's the most important thing because I never had a role model. 
and you think immediately, how many kids are out there that see that Harvey Milk or a Glenn Maxey or a Nice Parker or name the hundreds of people that have come since and think, I can do that. I can grow up and be just like you. That was not on my bingo card when I was 13 or 14 that I would ever be able to grow up and be just like anybody that was like me. That's what I tell that kid. You can do anything you want to. Just get off your ass and do it.